so you should retire. Everyone, that is too late. I'm back. <laughs> we were, uh, Bond is opening today. It's my favorite movie, so I felt like I had to do something like that. Anyway, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. What's the mood of Elon today? The, the, the mood? It could be anything. I feel good. Do you? Yeah. All right, we have a lot to talk about. Great. Where do you do want it. to start? Uh, anywhere you'd like to talk. All right, China. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cryptocurrency. <laughs> what they're doing. Uh, that's my safe word, by the way. Okay, good, good. <laughs> Um, what they're doing for <laughs> cryptocurrency. Yeah. Cryptocurrency. Yeah, it'll kill any uh, five years. for later for us. Go ahead. <laughs> um, cryptocurrency in, in China. Yes. What they're um, doing around Bitcoin, et cetera. And then I'd like to pivot to what the U.S. is going to do around regulation. Uh, well, it, it, it would appear that they don't love cryptocurrency. It, appear, it appears yeah. like that. Yeah, it's subtle, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're hinting in that direction. Um, yeah, so um, I can't uh, speak to exactly why they don't like it that much, but uh, people can speculate for various reasons. Um, China, by the way, it ha is having some si significant uh, electricity generation issues. Yeah. So actually, I think part of it may actually be due to uh, electricity shortages in many parts of China. So uh, a lot of South, South China right now is having random um, power outages uh, because the power demand is higher than expected. Um, so you know, crypto mining might be playing a role in that. I'm not sure. Um, this is further than that. It is further than that. Um, well, I, I suppose uh, cryptocurrency is fundamentally aimed at um, reducing the power of a centralized government. Yes, it is. And they, they, they don't like that. Okay. That's my guess. Okay. So what do you think is going to happen? Does this I mean, maybe the audience has... The shares ideas. went up. It didn't matter after they announced this. They went down and they went up. You can change the shares of cryptocurrency more than China can. Yeah. Is that a good thing? Um, if it goes up, I suppose it is. Um, but, uh, I mean, I think there's... An always long-term role for for crypto, um, and um, you know, really, people should think of any kind of uh, money system, whether it's a store of value or currency, as as really a form of information. Um, if you apply information theory to money, whether it's cryptocurrency or some other form, um, and view it in terms of uh, you know how good is it at um, you know sort of bandwidth latency. Uh, jitter, uh, dropping packets, uh, which is, you could say like fraud is like losing packets or something on the network. Um, and, um, you know, it's overall security. Uh, then I think a lot of these things just seem, just make, make a lot of sense in that, sure. in that regard. Like uh, any form of money has no power in and of itself except as an exchange of uh, value between people uh, for goods or services or to translate uh, things in time, like a loan. So is this the right thing for governments to do, to take control of it? Is it possible? I, I, it is not possible to, I think, destroy crypto, but it is possible for governments to uh, slow down its advancement. So what should the U.S. government do? We had Gary Gensler on earlier, SEC chairman. He was calling it the wild west of finance. What should they do? If anything, I would say do nothing. Okay, they're yeah. not saying that. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't. I would say just, leave, just let let it fly. Because. Um, well, what what do you think governments can do? I think they can, like you said, I think they can ruin it. I don't think they can just slow it down. I think they can stop it. I don't think they can control it, and therefore they may want to stop it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm some, you know, massive cryptocurrency expert. Um, you know, I, I think the, you know, there's, there's some value to cryptocurrency. I don't think it's like the, sep, the second coming of the Messiah, which some people seem to think. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it will hopefully reduce the uh, error and latency in 
the money system, the legacy money systems, and reduce the, yeah, I mean, just, you know, uh, governments have a habit of um, editing the money database, um, which is like probably some ancient mainframe somewhere in Virginia running COBOL, FI. <laughs> it's kind of bleak to think about that. Um, um, but uh, so, you know, when governments can't keep their hand out of the cookie jar and edit the money database, there's probably some value to that. Okay, so what are you, you're saying you're not an expert, but you spend a lot of time tweeting about it. Now, you tweet about a lot of things, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but why true. is that, why, why, that's true. Why is that of interest to you, crypto? Because you become, I wouldn't say the crypto messiah, but you <laughs> Crypto messiah. That's gonna be a Oh no. Um, well, I, I mean, I mostly don't tweet about crypto. This is a minority of small number of tweets. Okay. So. Um, I do know a lot about the money system and payments and how it actually works as opposed to, say, how uh, economists think it works um, on, on a practical basis, just how money, money is just a, basically the, the monetary system is a series of heterogeneous databases uh, that uh, are not real time with the exception of PayPal and a few others um, and, engage, and to reconcile on a batch basis uh, uh, you know that that may take anywhere from 24 hours to several days, um, and um, so it's just it's slow. That's just a lot of latency and jitter, and uh, it's, it, the uh, ACH system is has basically no security. Um, so, and this has just been been the it was that way when PayPal started in '99, and it's uh, still that way 22 years later. It's needs reform. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so I want to move on to. Um, China, I want to stick with China for a second. You're operating there, selling there. What do you make of what they're doing to the tech entrepreneurs there, the tech moguls? Um, well, hmm. Where is Jack Ma? Where is Jack Ma? <laughs> I know. I, do you know? Just, I, no, I'm just curious. <laughs> um, you have some means to find out, I'm guessing. I, well, uh, maybe, um, I don't know, I think there's, there's, there, there, are, there, there are some uh, changes afoot in China. Um, I think part of this may be um, actually COVID related in the sense that um, it's been quite difficult to have in-person meetings in China and China really runs, the whole system is set up to run on the basis of in-person meetings. And the absence of, of, of these meetings for the past 18 months, I think, has um, probably led to things being worse than they would be if there were more in-person meetings. Okay. Um, so I think as COVID lifts and the in-person meetings return, I think the, uh, the, I think probably there will be an increase in the, in the sort of trust level, and I think things will probably start heading in a more positive direction. The trust level between tech and the government. Yeah, both internally within China and uh, with respect to uh, people from the U.S. and other countries going and visiting and meeting with uh, officials in the Chinese government. Now, it's just, it, it, China is very much set up to work with uh, in-person meetings, and so COVID, I think, has impeded that. Um, so I think, I think things will improve most likely as the in-person meetings should re resume. So um, they, they did these antitrust actions because they couldn't say hello. Um, I think it, not all of it can be ascribed to that, but it's uh, some of it uh, can be. Um, yeah, um, well, we'll see. I, 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 I suspect things will improve next year because of just better, more interaction. Are you nervous about what you're doing there? It's a big market for you. It's a, you, you operate there. Yeah, um, we've got a big factory in Shanghai. Which is doing very well. The Tesla China, the Tesla China team is uh, doing great work, and um, we we do well with selling in the Chinese market as well as producing cars for China and for export to Europe. Um, so overall, things are going pretty well, frankly. You're not worried about U.S.-China relations. I don't. It's it's not. No, not not especially right now. Not especially. All right. So let's talk about space. 
You had a, you had a recent um, space. You had sent up a bunch of civilians into space. You did yeah. not send yourself up. Uh, no, I've not sent myself up. Um, I suppose I will at some point. Uh, but my goal is not to send myself up. My goal is to uh, open up space for humanity and ultimately set us on a path to becoming a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species. Yes. So you don't want to go up yourself? It's neither here nor there. I will go at some point. What do you think of the other efforts to go suborbital? Suborbital, suborbital is a step in the direction of orbit, uh, but... <laughs> 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 so, um, but just to, to put things into perspective, you need about 100 times more energy to get to orbit that, uh, versus suborbit. Um, and then to get back from orbit, you need to burn off that energy. So you need a like, heavy duty heat shield because you're coming in like a meteor. Yes. So, so like, orbit is roughly two orders of magnitude more difficult than, than suborbit. Uh, but it's still you know, good to do something in space. What did you think watching those, uh, both uh, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos doing that? Um, I thought it was cool that they're um, spending money on the advancement of space. I think we ultimately want to be, humanity wants to be, uh, should, should want to be a space-faring civilization and out there among the stars. And we want, I think we, we really want, you know, I mean, all these things that we see in science fiction movies and books, like, you know, we want those to be, like, real one day, not always fiction. Right. Uh, so I think it's good that uh, people are spending their money advancing space technology. So last time we talked, we didn't talk a lot about space. We talked about a whole bunch. We talked about meat flaps, which was Elon's word for speaking. Which yeah. Was, we're flapping our... Yeah. Slow tonal wheezing. Yes, that's right. When I sound like it right now. <laughs> um, I, that's what we sound like to a computer. Right. Like whale sound, slow down. Yeah. So we didn't talk about space. So let's talk a little bit about where you think you've advanced with what you're doing. Because I think you're probably the most fast forward of all these efforts. Yeah, so with respect to SpaceX, um, let's see. Um, the, I mean, there's two... Besides uh, orbital human spaceflight and uh, providing transport for uh, NASA of astronauts and cargo to and from the space station, which we've, we've been doing for a while now, over a decade, um, uh, we are we, we have something called Starlink, which is a global internet uh, system, um, and this is, I think, going to have some profound positive effects on the world because this, uh, Starlink is really designed to serve the the least served. Um, you have 1,300 satellites up right now, is that correct? 1,500, yeah. And you want to put 30,000? Um, yeah. <laughs> we'll get to space pollution in a minute, but explain what were the reasons for it. Yeah, so in order to provide high bandwidth, low latency connectivity to a large number of people, um, you need, uh, need a lot of satellites, um, and they need to be at low Earth orbit so that latency is, is low. Uh, the problem with uh, satellites that are at geostationary orbit is that they are, uh, you know, around 36,000 kilometers, uh, whereas we are at uh, 550 kilometers. So gigantic difference in latency. Um, uh, I mean, for, for the Starlink system, you could play like a competitive video game um, that's, that's latency dependent and, and still be able to play it with Starlink. Um, it, it's, it's like browsing a terrestrial system, essentially. Um, and uh, but, but, but Starlink is really, um, just to be clear, not a threat to uh, 5G or uh, terrestrial fiber or anything like that. It's, um, but it's very well suited to uh, low to medium density regions of the Earth, uh, places that where it is too expensive to trench fiber or put uh, cells, you know, 5G cellular base stations. Uh, and so uh, it's really a good, it, it kind of takes care of the, the people that, that just didn't, didn't get internet, or, or either the internet's too, too slow or too expensive, or they just don't have it at all. It's, it's very well suited, a space-based system for serving like the least served, maybe 5% or something like that. How big a part of your space business is it from your perspective? I mean, I think it's, it's quite significant in that the launch side of things, just, just launching other people's satellites and serving the space station, 
uh, probably tops out around you know three or four billion dollars a year of revenue. Whereas if we can get to say three percent of global internet traffic, then that that's and, and that's roughly a trillion dollar a year business. Then we can increase our revenue by an order of magnitude to more like the thirty billion or something like that. Um, and and then we can use the proceeds from that to uh, develop the rocket technology necessary to get humanity to Mars and to the moon and else, elsewhere in the solar system. So that, that's so then the you know so so I think Sonic is is, is good in and of itself uh, for providing uh, like I said providing internet access to the, the the least served in the world. I think it's a fundamentally good thing in that respect. Um, and also offering a little bit of competition in the cities, although the, the you know Stalin can really maybe uh, serve less than five percent of people in a city. It's just because of the way the the, the, the spark beams from space are very big. So um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a very nice compliment um, and a necessary compliment to five uh, G and uh, fiber. Um, so. Uh, and, and like I said, it will provide a, a revenue stream for us to develop um, our next generation rocket, which is uh, Starship. Um, with, with Starship, the, the, we're, we're trying to achieve the, uh, a fundamental breakthrough that is the holy grail of rocketry. Uh, that is to have a fully reusable orbital rocket. Um, this, is, this is extremely fundamental. Um, with Falcon 9, we, we have a mostly reusable rocket. Which you recently proved it landed, correct? Uh, we've been landing for quite a while now, but um, so we, we, in fact, a number of our boosters are on their tenth uh, reflight. So uh, we, we've we've shown that uh, re reusing the the uh, boost stage uh, is can be done, and that it is economically uh, sensible to do What's so. What's the difference in price between our with Falcon Nine and competitors? Um, and using a reusable rocket. Oh, oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, so uh, it's, it's it's really gigantic. Um, uh, with, with with Falcon Nine, we still have to uh, lose the upper stage, and you can think of, think of each stage being like the equivalent of a jet airplane. So the boost stage is like the big jet airplane. Upper stage is the small jet airplane. We still throw away the small jet airplane every time. Um, so. Falcon 9 is able to be the most competitive rocket in the world because we recover the boost stage and the fairing, uh, but that, but, but still our best case marginal cost of launch, not taking into account uh, overhead allocation, is about 15 million dollars per launch. Yeah, for 15 tons to orbit, That's, which is quite big. Like the, the, uh, uh, SpaceX, um, over the last year or so, has uh, delivered about I think roughly two thirds of all payload to orbit of Earth. Um, and most of the remaining third is China, and then everyone else is kind of in the, in the uh, miscellaneous. Um, so, um, so anyway, so so, but we still have a it's still fifteen million dollars because of the most of because. What's of the, the cost differential between that and what you're aiming for? Yeah. So, um, basically, Falcon Nine is effectively about half to a third the cost of alternatives. Um, because of the reuse of the boost stage. With uh, Starship, uh, we should be able to get to the point where uh, it's maybe 1% the, the, the cost of uh, an expendable system. So that would just be a million bucks, right? Or yeah, it, it, the marginal cost of launch we think can be, um, we, we, it could be potentially under a million dollars. So is anybody close? For, for over 100 tons to orbit. 100 more though, than 15, you said 15. Yes, 100, 100 tons likely, and with refinement of the design, probably 150 tons. So essentially, it's, it would be um, you know, uh, 10 times the payload of Falcon 9 uh, for um, 15 times lower cost. So when is that uh, happening? 100 fold better, you know, it's really um, profound. Um, essentially, with, with Starship, it is possible uh, to make the economics close for creating a self-sustaining city on Mars um, and, and a base on the moon for those who want to go there. Um, and uh, so it's a really very, very profound development. Um, 
And that's what I'm spending most of my time on is uh, driving the development of Starship. Starship, so you can go to Mars, or, or you want a civilization on Mars? A uh, civilization on Mars. So what's first, the moon base or moon base first, correct? I mean, the moon is close, so we might as well. OK. Yeah. You might as well. It's practically right there, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. So you, um, you got a contract with the Defense Department to do a lunar lander. Which from is being, NASA. From NASA, um, which is being disputed by Jeff Bezos. Yes. How do you feel about that? Well, I think I've uh, expressed my thoughts on that front. Um, you know, uh, if, if it, I, I think he should put more uh, of his energy into uh, getting to orbit uh, than lawsuits. Um, okay. you, you, can't, you cannot sue your way to the moon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no matter how good your lawyers are. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so why isn't he doing that? I don't know. I also like to make fun of his rocket. I we all make fun of each other's rockets. <laughs> I, I mean, I think it does have, uh, I mean, it could be a different shape, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> could you explain from a technological point of view why it's that shape? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you are only going to doing suborbital, then your rocket can be sort of sure. shorter, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, have you called him and said, cut the shit, get bigger, or what? I mean, I have, I have encouraged um, him to emphasize uh, getting to orbit, yes. Do you talk to him? Um, not verbally. Not verbally. <laughs> <laughs> what is it, mind meld? No, mind? just, uh, you know. Tweet at him. Yeah, yeah, tweet at yeah, him. Yeah, exactly. Subtweet, if you want. Subtweet. So, <laughs> what is subtweet? You do subtweet at him. So, what... So what are you going to do with the lunar lander, and how do you get the moon base there? Yeah, so um, Starship is designed essentially as a general purpose uh, transport system to anywhere in the solar system uh, because it is a propulsive lander. Um, and with a propulsive lander, uh, you can land anywhere that's got a solid surface. Um, so. Uh, and, and it's also designed for uh, orbital refilling. So you can uh, get the Starship to orbit and then um, send tanker flights to refill it so that it has a uh, tremendous uh, delta velocity. Basically, it, it can go very far from Earth orbit because you can uh, refill propellant. The moon base is important because? Um, well, I think the, the moon base, I mean, certainly there's like a lot we could learn scientifically if we had a proper laboratory on the moon um, about the nature of the universe and, you know, where we all came from and the early history of Earth and that kind of thing. You know, we have a, a science station in Antarctica, and we're still learning a lot from, uh, you know, our, our activities in Antarctica, and I think we could learn uh, even more on the moon. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of value, I think, to having a... I think it'd be just freaking cool. I mean, come on. It's like, we got to, you know, humanity, let's, we got to represent here for humanity. You know, just have a base on the moon. I think everyone would be like, yeah, hell yeah, we got a base on the moon. That's cool. Yeah. You know? Um, for tourism? Uh, what do you think? No, I'm so with the science, science, uh, science uh, I think, like, so, a, lot of, a lot could be learned if you've got a sort of a science station on the moon, like we've got a science station in, in Antarctica and many other places. Um, and uh, I think uh, th there's, I think there is value um, that shouldn't be denigrated for people who want to experience uh, going to orbit or going to the moon. Um, and um, you know, when they do so, you know, I think to some degree, vicariously, we, we all go with them. You know, when in, in, when in the Apollo program, when they landed on the moon, um, yeah, it was just a handful of individuals on the moon, but. We all went with them, vicariously. We, humanity went with them. Like, if you, if you, if you asked Peter to Paul of, of people on Earth and said, tell me, what do you think is uh, humanity's greatest achievement of the, maybe ever? Well, it's like landing on the moon, you know? And that's inspiring, I think, to kids everywhere. So you just brought, sent up four civilians. Is that space tourism you're doing? And by the way, 
You have to be kind of rich to do it, like from what I understand. I cannot afford to go to the moon, for example. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, I think, I think, I think, I think it's, nice. it's got a bit more gravitas than, um, okay. you know, metaphorically, <laughs> figuratively and literally, um, more gravitas than, uh, you know, simply tourism. Um, it's not like going to Disneyland, you know, it's like, uh, it's more, more profound than that. Um, so sometimes people use tourism in a sort of a negative way, but um, I think, you know, especially with the, the inspiration flight, I think they, they really, I mean, they, they, you know, they filmed the whole thing in real time. Um, you know, they, they shared their experiences with the world. Um, it was a really cool group of people. Um, I recommend uh, watching the Netflix uh, show Countdown. Mark Penny, I've talked about it. It's awesome. Um, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, and and uh, the production value on the Netflix uh, Countdown documentary is amazing. Um, and you learn about the backstory of the people. And um, it's, uh, so it's, like it's actually super. Tourism. You don't like it. This is for science and for saving humanity, presumably. Yeah, I think uh, what, what, what tourism. Um, I think that there's an element of tourism to it, but I think you know it, there's also uh, you know the technology is expensive at first. Um, you, you you can't just when you're trying to develop brand new technology, it doesn't instantly become uh, cheap and affordable. I mean, think of like cell phones, and the early cell phones were were really expensive and and sucked. You know, yeah. <laughs> frankly, like you know, you think of like Wall Street one where. You know, he's walking down the beach with the shoebox-sized cell phone on it. You know, talking to this, and and uh, so just like really expensive, and the tech wasn't that great. But but if 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 some number of people didn't pay for the expensive cell phones, there would not be the inexpensive cell phones that everyone can afford. So, so thank billionaires for going into space. Um, I mean, you know, uh, it doesn't have to be top of your th thank you list, but I mean, it's not. Um, <laughs> I'm just saying that there is a when there's new technology, uh, it is necessarily expensive until uh, y you can refine the design and you can scale things up um, and then you can make it more affordable. Um, there's it, a common misconception that there's some, with some new, new technology, especially if it's a physical object, that you can just suddenly make it cheap and available. Um, and, and, um, but but you, you have to have many design iterations and you've got to scale up the production and get economies of scale. Like we had this argument um, against Tesla for for a long time because people would say like, "Well, why are you building this Tesla Roadster back in the day? It's it's basically, a, you know, it's, the, it's an expensive toy sports car for rich people." And we're like, "Yes, it is, um, but um, there's no way we could build an affordable electric car as our first car. Uh, Any, you know, we, we just didn't have the capital, we didn't have the experience, and we needed to go through several technology iterations." In order to get to something like the Model Three, right? Um, and um, I actually wrote a blog about this because I knew people would be like, "Why are you making sports cars for rich people?" Rich people, as though we thought there was somehow a shortage of sports cars for rich people. Uh, and we're obviously not, um, but but you just gotta you, you gotta figure out the technology. Uh, you gotta go through multiple design. Like, like how do you make something mass market and affordable? Uh, many many design iterations, many many different versions of the technology. Um, a lot of hard work, and then you've got to scale up the, the production rate uh, so you get economies of scale. And those two things are what make any given technology available to the public. And, and basically, every uh, technology that we take for granted today has gone through that uh, So the idea evolution. of getting to Mars will be affordable someday? Yes, absolutely. And it has to be. In order for, it, um, in order for Mars to be a self-sustaining civilization, it has to be affordable. When you say that, enough people need to go. You know. Why do you want people to go when you just keep saying that? Because you're worried about this planet. Or are you just betting the odds are we'll either blow it up or it'll it'll be the day after tomorrow movie? No, I, I think it's, it's really um, you know if if you sort of look you know uh, just sort of stand back um, just if we just if we just step away from our sort of Antonisian squabbles and say. Let's look at the big picture here. Um, uh, what, what set of actions can we take that maximize the probability that the future is going to be good for civilization and for consciousness? And I think we should regard consciousness on Earth as delicate, not uh, you know, just fragile. Um, and you know, what sort of actions can we do to ensure that it continues and that the scope and scale of consciousness uh, expands? 
And um, and I'm I'm in favor of of, of expansion because uh, like you know um, if we want to understand what the universe is about and and what's the meaning of life and we need to get out there and find out. Um, and the more we expand the scope and scale of consciousness, the better we will be able to understand what questions to ask about the answer that is the universe. So when you get a lot of criticism, say, about the Starlink space pollution, you see a lot of stories about space pollution. Why is Elon putting so many astronomers get mad at you? Or with um, the rockets, so that you have these big defense contracts that you're doing, correct? First time someone's broken into the area. How do you meet those criticisms? You're, this is just small potatoes? Well, first of all, with respect to the astronomers, um, we are in uh, constant dialogue with the leading astronomers of the world um, and taking great pains to ensure that um, our satellites do not interfere with their telescopes. Um, and we've, we've um, I, I believe at this point, they are satisfied that, that they will not. Um, so. Uh, yeah, we, like I said, we take great pains to ensure that uh, the satellites do not reflect or, you know, uh, otherwise interfere with the, the the telescopes, including the most sensitive telescopes. So, um, you know, there may be a few sort of amateur astronomers who are unhappy, but the professional ones are are satisfied that we are taking reasonable steps to uh, ensure that we are not standing in the way of science, nor would we ever want to. Um, and we're also looking at uh, launching some. Uh, new telescopes using Starship, because Starship's a much bigger vehicle. We can um, launch satellites that have uh, 10 times the resolution of the Hubble, which would be great for science. Um, and um, in fact, we were, um, there's an exciting program uh, working with uh, Sol uh, Perlmutter at uh, Berkeley on um, a, a big new space satellite, um, a, a space telescope, I should say. Um, and I think we'll do we'll do more of those. So I think at the end of the day, uh, Starship um, and, and SpaceX are going to um, do a lot to advance uh, our understanding of uh, astrophysics and astronomy. You still want to? You said to me last a couple of times ago we talked. You want to die on Mars? You still want to die on Mars? Um, well, just not on landing, uh, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's not an impact. Right. Yeah. Well, that would be spectacular. Yes, but you wouldn't get to enjoy it much, if, you know, just a second Talking or so. Talking about maybe. a narrative for the rest. Of <laughs> yeah, no. Well, I was just asked, uh, "Do you want to die on Mars?" And I was like, "Well, I suppose if you're going to pick Earth or Mars, and like, it'd be cool to like be born on Earth and die on Mars." I, I'm, not, I'm not. I'm not like trying to make a beeline to Mars and just you know die or something. Um, uh, <laughs> Um, it's just that uh, yeah, you got to pick one. You got to die somewhere. Uh, well, sure, Mars. Uh, okay. um, I think what, so, I've interviewed a lot of astro. Uh, I guess they're biologists. They're worried about. Um, essentially, they said you have to be under the Earth, a couple hundred feet. No, no, no. You it's get just, short. Definitely stupid. not a couple. Not, right. not a couple hundred. Feet, yeah, you know, you just need. Um, first of all, half the time you're shielded by this, by Mars itself. Um, that's half the radiation is just the planet shielding you. And then um, you, you want to make maybe ha have like, I don't know, three feet of dirt-ish on the roof, or just kind of a thick roof. Um, and you'll be fine. Um, so, so you're not worried about becoming shorter and stupider by moving to Mars? Uh, no, I think we might uh, become taller, actually, on Mars. A little, yeah. bit, little bit taller, yeah, because the gravity is roughly 40% that of Earth. Okay, that would be good for me. Um, <laughs> when you think about... Um, but but, but I, think, I do think there's like an important thing. Which, for, if you think of the various great filters, um, if you feel familiar with the, the sort of great, great filter of thought, um, you know, one of the filters is do we become a, a, a multi-planet species or not? Right. Um, so that is at least one of the, one of the great filters. And we would, I think it would be great to uh, pass that. Um, and have um, be a multi-planet species where the, the, the critical threshold is uh, it, on for a Mars city. If, if the resupply ships from Earth stop coming for, for any reason, whether that is civilization on Earth, uh, it could be a mundane reason or it could be World War III. Um, but does Mars prosper or die out? Um, and if Mars is missing anything at all, um, like the civilizational equivalent of vitamin C, then it will eventually die out. So you need to get to the point where 
uh, a Mars city is self-sustaining, even if the, Earth, uh, the ships from Earth stop coming, then you have passed the great filter, or at least that particular great filter. And I think we should uh, endeavor to uh, pass that great filter as soon as possible. When? Um, you said pretty soon last time we talked. Yeah, I mean, I think we should really try hard to make it happen this century, um, before the end of the century. You'll be pretty old. Uh, I'll probably be dead. Yeah. yeah. Not on Mars. Well, I mean, I'll, you know, pop over there when I'm old or something. Okay. So, um, one of the things you're doing is a lot of government deals. You're doing this lunar lander. You did the rocket one. Um, you're getting billions from $2.9 billion. Is that right? Well, right now we're not getting anything because we're being sued. Right. That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But you're getting a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> well, hopefully this. we'll get it. <laughs> right. Right. When it's over. Yeah. Um, and he fixes. I, I mean, most of our launches are commercial, to be clear. It's, yes, I understand yeah. that. But you're doing a lot of government work. So, what, is, what is that like working with the government? I mean, is I that important to your business? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an important part of it's an important part of the business. I mean, just just bear, I mean, bear in mind if like if you're in any industry, like let's say you're a pencil manufacturer, okay, about forty percent of your pencils are going to go to the government. Right. The, the government's about forty percent of the economy. You know, if you're a shoe manufacturer, you about forty percent of your business is going to be with the government. So. You know, it's to be expected that any any company is going to have a, uh, uh, most companies are going to have a um, percentage of business with the government, state, federal, and local, that is proportionate to the GDP uh, of the government. So, one of the criticisms of you is you don't pay enough taxes, if any. Um, can you address that? Because here you are getting money from the government. You obviously want a functioning government uh, to be able to build all kinds sure. of things and services. How do you look at that trade-off? Uh, well, I mean, there was a bunch of uh, very misleading stuff that was published uh, by ProPublica. Um, and really, that was some sort of was trickery. And uh, really, they, they did themselves no good service by, by, by doing that. Um, uh, so first of all, with respect to the government contracts that, that uh, SpaceX wins, uh, our aspiration is to do the most for the least. And if you look at all the contracts we've won, um, we've won them because we're the best price. We have a better service at a lower price. They weren't just handed to us. No, I don't think um, they were. And that's what I'm saying. In fact, you called me and said we finally got in after years of sort yeah. of this back slappy. I think it's a great thing. That is yeah, a great thing. Absolutely. I mean, in, in the, for the Lunar Lander, just taking that as one example, um, uh, our bid was half the price of the Blue Origin uh, Lockheed uh, bid. Half. So for a vehicle that does basically 10 times more or eight times more, perhaps, um, our, our price was half. Okay. And NASA has a mandate to get back to the moon. So we saved taxpayers like $3 billion relative to that contract. Um, so I think that's, that's a good thing. Uh, with respect to my personal taxes, um, the, um, I don't actually draw a salary or anything. My cash compensation is basically zero. Um, Which so, is a good thing because income is a problem for most people because they pay taxes on income. That was yeah, the whole point of the story, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I do have stock options um, that best. And so in the years that the, but, but I don't, I, I basically, with um, Tesla and SpaceX, I just, um, have not really bothered to sort of take money off the table, which is a common, most people do. They sell some of their stock and they take money off the table. Um, and for me, I just like said, I, you know, my money will be the sort of, it was, it was the first in and it'll be the last out. Um, and um, the success of SpaceX and Tesla was far from assured. And there are many times when it looked like the companies would, and they, they did, they skirted bankruptcy many times, but I never tried to take money off the table. And now this is being, trying to be, be turned around and, and made into a bad thing. And I, this is, that's messed up. Um, so, um, but, but when my uh, stock options, uh, um, just before my stock options expire, then I, I am forced to exercise. And my top marginal tax rate is 53%. So I, I don't think that's particularly low. And it's going to go up next year. It's like probably 57% or something. Like that. And you sell. Yes. And, and I, uh, I, um, I have a bunch of options that are expiring uh, early next year, so I'm uh, th that a huge block of options will sell in Q4, 
because I have to, or they'll expire. Um, and my top marginal tax rate uh, is 53%. So you eventually uh, will pay a lot of taxes. Massive, yeah. I mean, basically the majority of, of what I sell will be tax. I don't think it was alleging illegality. It's that uh, wealthy people got to borrow against their stock. Uh, yes, they were, they were saying that like, somehow borrowing is a trick to get away from paying taxes, but um, it's more important to bear in mind that we've had a, a very long expansion uh, in, in the economy, maybe the longest ever, and borrowing against stock is all, is all sort of fun and games until you have a recession and you get the margin calls, and then you go to zero, which, is, which happens basically every time there's a recession. Right. Um, stocks don't always go up. They go down. Yours seems to. Most stocks have gone up, including some questionable stocks, frankly. Are you uh, talking about yourself? I'm sorry. Um, I think Are you surprised by how much it's gone up and how wealthy you've become? See, I mean, I have literally gone on record and said I think our stock price is too high, in my opinion. And this did nothing to stop the rise of the stock price. No. Um, so, I don't know, what am I supposed to do, you know? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm not the one making it go up. Um, so, um, but I think it's important to bear in mind, like, like my t actual tax rate is 53%. They try to make it sound r like basically it was a, a big increase in the value of the Tesla stock, and then they added up, they, they just very selectively poked at the numbers to make it sound like I was paying very low taxes. But in fact, my taxes are very high. They're like over half. Um, when you pay them, when you will pay. Yes, and a, a huge amount will be paid uh, um, in the next three months because of expiring uh, options. And, and there was like one year where I think my taxes were basically zero. And the, the reason for that was because I had overpaid taxes the year before. But I forgot to mention that. You didn't call <laughs> them back. I'm not going to call them back. They have no interest <laughs> in the truth. Oh, okay. All right. Um, let me ask you a question. Um, uh, Twitter. Let's finish with Twitter and then let's get to questions from the audience. What's going on with you and Twitter? I am a Twitter addict. I say the wrong things all the time. What is, someone explained it to me, I was very close to you, saying it's your release valve. This is where you feel better. Yeah, I think I said some people, some, happy people, some, some people use their hair to express themselves. I use Twitter. Do you regret any of it or not? You are kind of prominent. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, Walk us through when you decide to do a, a tweet. Go, no, no, no. Well, yes. I think about it for hours. Do you? And I consult with my strategy team. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just literally go, yeah. 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 One of or them. maybe I'm wasted and I've uh, gone. <laughs> <laughs> let me shoot myself in the foot. Bam. Now let me shoot myself in the foot. Bam. Yeah. <laughs> that describes some of my tweets. Yeah. <laughs> Are you um, worried about any SEC? involvement in your tweets going forward? Um, what does that stand for again? I mean, I know the middle word is Elon's, but <laughs> I can't remember the other two words. <laughs> you need to answer me. You need to answer me. Are you worried they're going to say, Elon, stop fucking tweeting? You're talking about the Short Seller Enrichment Commission? Yeah. 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 Short Seller Enrichment that, That's the new name. Is it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I asked about the particular recent tweet you did about, um, you did one great tweet about time, saying time is the uh, currency, which I thought was beautiful. Time is the ultimate currency, yes. Um, no matter what resources you have, you can't wind back the clock. It's true, yeah. no matter how rich you are. Yeah. Um, but then you did the Biden tweet. Can you explain that one? Oh, when, um, well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so, you know, like Biden held this uh, EV summit, um, didn't invite Tesla, um, invited um, GM, Ford, Chrysler, and UAW, an EV summit on the White House, um, didn't mention Tesla once, and praised GM and Ford for leading the EV revolution. So you were pissed. Does this, does this sound, does this sound uh, maybe a little biased uh, or something? Um, so, um, and then, you know, just, uh, just not the friendliest administration. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah. Seems to be controlled by the unions, as far as I can tell. So, 
Are you waiting to get Trump back? Uh, no. Who would you like to be president besides yourself? I would not want to be president at all. Uh, sounds like no, no fun being president. Um, what do you think is going to bring our country together, if at all? Moving to Mars, what? Well, I think if there was some um, moderate, you know, sort of, sort of centrist pr president, then I think uh, that would help. Um, you know, that I think everyone just wants. Uh, I think most people, most people want um, a president who is just a very competent, you know, executive. You know, not too far left, not too far right, um, and. Uh, and everyone would be like, I mean, most people would, would prefer that. Uh, you know, some, when it comes down to the election, you've got two choices. And you're like, oh, you know, maybe you don't love either choice, but you've got to pick one. Do you think that'll happen? Do I think there will be what? Centrist. I hope so. I yeah, hope so. Are that, you that'd be nice. about democracy? Um, I'm not super worried about democracy. Um, are you worried about democracy? Oh, a smidge. A smidge. What, what concerns you? Uh, a lot of the, the dialogue is getting a little. I study propaganda. Oh, well, yeah. It's worrisome. The fact that it can happen here, it certainly can. I'm a Philip Roth kind of person. So. Yeah. Um... But we're both having a lot of children, so we must believe in the future. Yes, children. We have ten children between us, correct? I believe yes. <laughs> You're slightly ahead, but um, you've got a rocket. Um, anyway, I, I, um, I, 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 do, I do think we, there is, um, you know, I think a lot of people think that there's too many people on the planet, but I think there's, in fact, too few, and that the, the possibly the single greatest risk to human civilization is the uh, rapidly diminishing growth rate. And the facts are out there for anyone to look at. Um, but a lot of people are still stuck with, you know, Pearl, uh, Paul Ehrlich's book, uh, Population Bomb. And it's like, ah, uh, that was a long time ago. Uh, that is not the case today. Um, and uh, there's a, there was a massive notch uh, in demographics last year because uh, the birth rate plummeted, and also this year. So more children. So, I mean, if, you know, no, no babies, no humanity. So you got to right. come from somewhere. Okay. We're going to end on that. We need questions from audience because there's a lot of great questions. Hey, Lana. I'm Ronan Levy from Field Trip. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about outer space. Um, we want to ask you about inner space. And the question specifically is, do you spend time thinking about humanity's somewhat destructive tendencies before sending people to Mars? And Specifically, you've talked about the subject of DMT, and curious to know what role you think psychedelics may have in addressing some of the more destructive tendencies of humanity. We're going to talk about this tomorrow. Okay. Um, um, well, I think generally uh, people should be open to psych psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, clearly it's a, I mean, you know, yeah. A lot of people making laws are kind of from a different era, um, so I think as um, you know, as as the new generation gets into political power, I think we will see uh, greater receptivity to the benefits of psychedelics. Uh, Does humanity's tendencies right now concern you, like about before we go to, to Mars? I mean, <laughs> humanity's tendencies. I mean, we are at a very peaceful moment in history. Um, so, you know, you've got to separate the sort of news headlines from the reality. Um, I think, like, Steven Pinker at Harvard has really pointed this out. Like, we're actually at the lowest violence per capita in, his, in human history. Um, it may not seem like that, but objectively, those are the statistics. Um, that's not to say there's no violence or there aren't things to be improved, but it's, you know, it's actually quite good. In the, in the, uh, so, um, but, uh, you know, just like I said, in, big picture-wise, I think we want to take the set of actions that maximize the probability that the future is good um, and that, the, and, uh, that uh, civilization continues um, and that the uh, 
sort of this small candle of consciousness in the void that is humanity um, continues and there's not, is not the, the candle does not go out. Okay, next, up here. Hello, um, my name is Lena. I'm a student at the University of Chicago and I also have a podcast called Kind of Sort of Brown. Um, so my question centers a little bit what you talked about concerning that, you know, you're building this world for not enough people yet, but <laughs> the people that now are here. Um, but concerning young people, how do you actually build infrastructure to make sure that you're not just building resources for people to be in Mars, but actually putting them in positions of power politically or educating people who don't have access to learn about space, technology, et cetera. How do you actually teach young people and bring them? And do you feel like that's your role or is it your role to just build the spaceship to Mars? Well, our, our primary goal is, is to create the technology necessary to get people to Mars, in the absence of which, not, you know, it's somewhat academic. Um, so we don't want to get too distracted from our primary mission of we, we, we've got to make it at least possible to, get, to go to Mars. Um, and we, we want to uh, do so as soon as possible um, and make uh, access to Mars as widely available as, as possible, as affordable as possible, so that if somebody wants to go, they can. Um, so that, that's, that's our primary mission. Um, I mean, there are many good causes in the world, but we, we've got to be careful that we do not try to um, take on too many. Uh, I mean, there, there are many noble missions, but we, we, we have to pick our battles and say, okay, let's just make sure we, we get this done. Um, and uh, because nobody else is doing it. And I, I mean, if, if, uh, if SpaceX doesn't do it, I'm not sure how, how it will happen. I think this, this is, uh, at least right now, SpaceX is. Uh, the only hope. So we we got to get this done, and it's far from done. I mean, it's we've got a lot, lot long way to go. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, Starlink, in terms of providing internet, internet connectivity to uh, people that really don't have it or it's very expensive, I think will be helpful in um, empowering a lot of people who are disempowered today. So I think that's a good thing too. Great. Right. Thanks. Hi, Techno King. Um, how do you I, respond to allegations? You call that, him Techno King? Yeah. Okay. That is my formal title. I uh, filed that sorry. with the SEC. Got to be respectful, Kara. Yeah. All right. Okay. <laughs> how do you respond to allegations that uh, you're a living cybergenetic organism sent from the future to save us? And secondly, <laughs> and secondly I can neither confirm nor deny that. Uh, <laughs> he's good. He's good. And secondly, what do you think uh, the probability is that general purpose blockchains that have greater utility will eclipse the value of like a fish, finished product in Bitcoin? I actually, I'm not sure how to answer that last one. Um, I think just generally uh, public ledger stuff is good um, because uh, I'm a fan of open source and just, and just you know, uh, sunlight being a great disinfectant and the, the more, the less things occur in the dark, the better. Um, and uh, you know, it's sort of a, a cryptic. Basically, I mean, blockchain is sort of a, 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 just a, it's a cryptographic ledger, um, an open, you know. Um, so I think that uh, there's probably a lot of things, good things, that can be done with that. So. The first question. I said I could neither confirm nor deny. Okay. Right here. Hey, Elon. Alex Heath with The Verge. Um, the question's on the self-driving beta you guys are rolling out. Yeah. Curious why you're encouraging people to not share videos, and making them sign NDAs. Just be curious. Uh, no, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of videos being shared. Uh, but the NDAs. Pardon me? The NDAs for, for the full self-driving beta? I don't know. Um, People don't seem to listen to the MD. I mean, I'm not sure there's. Uh... Yeah, I don't, I don't know why there's an NDA. We probably don't need it. And people just are ignoring it anyway, so I'm not sure it matters. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ignore this. I'm going to keep getting questions. Let's do two. Hi, hi, Ilan Zia Yusuf from uh, BCG. Uh, could you talk a little bit about AI and robotics? And you've expressed concerns in the past, but you now building some as well. What do you see as 
the issues that we do have to solve on that front? Well, I've said for a long time, I think AI safety is a really big deal. Um, and we should have some regulatory agency that is overseeing uh, AI safety. Um, um, but there is not yet currently any such thing. And, and just generally, any kind of regulatory agency done by the government will usually takes years to put in place. Um, so, um, you know, after uh, the population collapse issue, I think AI safety is probably the second biggest um, threat to the future of civilization. Um, and, um, yeah, like I said, I'm not quite sure what to do with it. Um, I mean, Tesla is arguably the, the world's biggest robot maker because like, we have basically semi-autonomous semi cars that will ultimately be fully autonomous. Um, and we are building a humanoid robot that will be basically like, um, like, like the car, but with legs. Um, so, um, and I, I kind of uh, held off on doing that for a while because, you know, I, was, I, I certainly don't want to hasten the AI apocalypse. But clearly, with the, if you look at Boston Dynamics, and, and like this humanoid robots are going to happen. So um, they're either going to happen with or without Tesla. So it's like Tesla got a little bit more, I mean, a lot more ability to ensure uh, robotics safety and AI. Um, and I'll try my best to, to do that. What, what would you do to oh, No, we can't do more. Sorry. We got it quick. I, first, uh, thanks for making the first car I ever loved. Um, oh, I love the great. car. Um, my wife insisted I ask this question if I got here. Uh, we also have way too many children. Um, no, you, if, that's probably great. If there's any chance that you could put a roof rack on the X, that's what she's looking for. Uh, uh, we need a roof rack uh, uh, on the X. If, if you could figure that out, that's almost more important than going to Mars. Um, we have it's, not figured that out. I mean, it's tricky because we have the fancy doors. They're yeah. awesome. <laughs> they, yeah, the doors are awesome, but you know, if you have a roof rack, it's like, how do you stop the doors from smashing? <laughs> I heard you were smart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the Model Y has a roof rack, though. It's not big enough for all the kids. Really? The it, it, seats, it seats seven. Not, not normal kids. Ours, okay. okay. <laughs> what do you have? Separate cars for your children? You, you Elon. Elon. Um, Thanks for that. It does have a tow hitch. You, okay. you can tow your here. stuff. Those are the last two <laughs> questions. Elon, thanks for the plaid. It's a great car. Um, as we're all, uh, you know, waiting for full self-driving. That's awesome. Really, it's awesome. We, I, we might have to argue Next a bit level. about the yoke, but we're getting accustomed to it. It's a great car. Uh, you uh, know, it's, it's like something different, and it, uh, it, it's different, and people sometimes don't like the different thing. But How much did your kids push cool. you on the yoke? Great. Was it your kids? Blame, blame me my for the kids yoke. love the it's yoke, my fault. so that works for them. Anyway, really, really quick. Look, we're living in this in-between time between we drive our cars ourselves and the cars drive themselves. They're sure. semi-autonomous. For those of us in the industry, those of us who understand something about technology, about machine learning, I actually like it. It's pretty easy. It fixes my mistakes. I fix its mistakes. A lot in the press, though, about, and Google's position, certainly, is this is like the worst place to be, <laughs> right? Because people are going to get checked out and the cars are going to drive themselves into. What do you think about the ML human hybrids that we're kind of, you know, embracing right now? How long are we going to have these crossover periods? I know you believe S FSD is around the corner. Do you think this is really a problem? Or are we going to teach people to deal with ML? Well, I mean, the, the, the transition period um, to new technology is always a little bumpy. Um, Fair enough. And, um, but I think it, it, we, we published the, the safety stats, like basically miles driven uh, on autopilot and miles driven manually. And this, I mean, it's an order of magnitude different. So, like, people would say, oh, well, you're playing with the statistics. I'm like, listen, we're just saying miles driven on autopilot, miles not driven on autopilot, and there's a 10 up, factor of 10 difference. So, I mean, even if we were, like, we're not fiddling with the statistics. That's just, it, it, this is not subtle, is what I'm saying. It's not subtle. Um, the, the, the truth is that people are actually not great at driving these two-ton death machines, you know? And people get tired, and they, um, get drunk, and they get distracted, and they text, and they do all sorts of things they shouldn't do. Uh, and then the cars, they you know, crash, basically. Um, and um, 
Now, that, now the, the, when we were embarking on the autonomy front, uh, someone told me a thing that's quite true, which is even if you, for argument's sake, uh, reduce fatalities by 90% with autonomy, um, sure. <laughs> the 10% the that do die uh, with autonomy are still going to sue you. Right. <laughs> the 90% that are living don't even know that that's the reason they're alive. Um, Nonetheless, um, I've had many conversations with the Tesla autopilot full self driving team who are just an outstanding group of people um, and saying like, listen guys, it is, it is better to um, pursue, the, the, the reality of doing the right thing matters more than the perception of doing the right thing. And as long as we are confident that we're doing the right thing, even if we are criticized and sued and all that, uh, we should nonetheless do the right thing and not care about simply the perception of the right thing. Okay, last question, sorry. Rick Cutter, the Cloud for Utilities. Uh, thank you so much for the guard work you've done with, with Tesla driving the EV market. As we move towards more green energy, utilities are getting rid of their uh, fossil plants, coal plants, investing in, in renewables, there's a difference in the economic output they can deliver. Are you concerned at all as the growth of EVs continue do you think we could have a supply chain problem with energy down the road? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a very good question. Um, the full answer is, is lengthy. Um, I'll try to give this sh the short version. Um, the electricity demand roughly, if, if, we, go, if, we, if we shift um, or transport to electric, um, then electricity demand approximately doubles, maybe a little more than doubles. Um, and this is going to create a lot of challenges with the, the grid, um, especially for uh, distribution to uh, neighborhoods. Um, and this is why Tesla has the product, the, the solar roof and solar retrofit, uh, is because uh, even if you increase uh, sustainable power generation at the utility level, uh, you're still going to have a distribution problem where you need new high power lines, new medium power lines. Uh, you need to dramatically increase the size of the substations, which means you're going to have to start knocking down houses to increase the substation size. This is really uh, unworkable unless you have uh, significant local power generation at houses. And this is why I think it's actually very important that um, that uh, a, a necessary part of the solution is local power generation uh, on uh, on uh, rooms, uh, on, on the houses of homes. V very important. Um, and then of course we need um, large uh, sustainable power generation developments, uh, primarily wind and solar, um, uh, but it needs to be paired with battery packs for steady state so it can pro provide continuous power. Um, and a lot of good things are happening in this regard. The growth of solar in the last several years has been incredible. I think it's like a 40% um, compound annual growth rate in, in solar um, and uh, also a, a, a big growth in wind. Um, I'm also kind of a pro-nuclear, nuclear, nuclear, <laughs> pro-nuclear, um, uh, and um, you know I'm, I'm sort of surprised by a lot of the public sentiment against uh, nuclear, um, and um, you know I'm not saying we should go build a whole bunch of new nuclear plants, but I don't think we should shut down ones that are operating safely. Um, and um, but they did the, 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 they did this in Germany, for example. And I think that was and and then. And had to create a whole bunch of coal power plants, I, and I, I don't think that was uh, the right decision, frankly. So, um, um, yeah. Anyway, so, so we're, we're one way or another, though, we're going to have to have a lot more electricity generation, um, and this is this is primarily going to come down to solar and wind uh, paired with batteries. Which uh, will be our next conversation. Okay. Sounds Tesla, good. boring, solar. Sounds good. Okay. Great. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. One time we talked a couple of years ago, Code. You said we were in a simulation. This past couple of years has seemed truly fucked up. Yeah. It feels like a bunch of teenagers from the future are just really smoking a lot of dope and fucking with us. Are we, are we in a simulation? I mean, my heart says no, and my brain says yes. Elon Musk. <laughs>